Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Glory Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we're going to be talking about an important topic today, which is complicated grief. And uh, that it's never too late for hope. That we want you to know if you're feeling, if you're tired of feeling tired and you've had a loss, this is going to be a great show for you today. So Heidi, do you want to introduce our guest? Sure, Mom. Our guest today is Andrea Gillitz. And she is a brief spouse whose 52-year-old husband died after a five-month battle with cancer. She is a writer, educator, and yoga teacher. And she is the co-founder and longtime director of the University of Minnesota's legendary Split Rock Arts Program. She is also the author of the book, Restoring Flexibility, a general yoga-based practice to increase mobility at any age. Welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, And thank you, Gloria. I am very happy to be here uh, and talk about not only complicated grief, but also so importantly about the idea that um, we can never lose hope, that we're we're hopeful creatures in our natures. And it's no matter what we have been through, um, we're always on a journey toward ever greater hope. I love that. And you weren't thinking about that. Uh, how many years ago when your husband died? Yes, it's almost 24. Uh, and, you know, he died um, on July 28th, 1998. Uh-huh. And um, so it's been a very long time. But what's so interesting is that it really has taken me all this time to learn and become aware of of what is possible even after uh, a deep loss. Mm -hmm. So I know that in in reading some material about you that you wrote letters to your husband for a couple of years. Yes. And and you were really in pretty deep grief, right? Yes, very much so. I didn't know what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any insight into my own situation. I just knew that I was to say I was sad is an understatement. Uh, it, it was um, the worst sense of loneliness, of aloneness that I had ever experienced in my life. Mm. Uh, and I had been a single adult in my 20s. Uh, my husband and I weren't married until our early 30s. So, um, so I knew what it was like to be an independent adult. Uh, but nothing had ever affected me like this before. Uh, My grandparents had died. I felt sad about that, but somehow I was able to um, carry on. So I I didn't know what was happening to me, I think is, is the best way to say it. But at least what I was trying to do when I wrote letters to Tom every day was to literally continue our relationship Mm -hmm. so that I could still be talking with him and in touch with him and feel the connection to him. You were married to Tom for over 20 years, right? And he was only 52 when he died. Yes. And he was only sick for five months. Yes. So it must have been pretty shocking to you to think that you were going to grow old with him and all of a sudden he's 52 years old and he's dead within a five month time span. It was a shock. It leaves you at sea. It leaves you not having any moorings. Your foundation is gone. Um, I was in shock. And one thing I say in my memoir is that it's not shock for a few days or even a few months. It, you're you're in a state of acute grief, shock. Uh, for for me, it was years on end. Mm-hmm. So uh, someone said to me, it, it's like having the volume up too high forever. 
Mm. And you can't find a way to moderate. Mm -hmm. And that word loneliness, I know, is so profound for people. So profound. 19 years after Tom died, I looked, finally looked at these letters that I had written. And it was looking at those letters that made me realize, you know, this is a story that might be helpful to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was really what motivated me to start writing. So it was 19 years. One thing I learned when I read them is that, um, that I could read them that they they didn't bring horrible painful thoughts back to me that i could um be with them and that meant that i finally had a way to be with the grief that i had suffered with so long mm. and the other thing i think is so you asked about turning points and what after about a decade of this very acute grief that put me into what I call in my book, a prison, literally, that I couldn't find a way out of. Mm. Um, that's how it felt. And yet, at the same time, I think I became kind of addicted to my grief. It became my friend. I wouldn't have known what to do without it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I, it's because I was at sea so long. Um, then something happened inside me and I was aware of it at the time. I began to feel tired of being sad and miserable all the time. Um, and I, it's not that I can point to an event particularly, but I got tired of it. It, it in a way it, it bored me <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that when when I began to sense that change in myself, that's when I began to take action steps toward hope. You know, uh, when you say that, I have always said that, um, is that when you start getting bored with your own story, yes, the opportunity to tell it and tell it, I think is part of uh, what we're talking about. And when we look at complicated grief nowadays, is yes. that it is, a process of telling your story and learning new things about your story. I, I, I know that you've been looking at and studying complicated grief a bit. And I wondered, I thought it might be useful for you to maybe give a quick synopsis of what complicated grief is. You know, how do you know if you've got it? One of the best definitions I've heard of complicated grief, or it's been in the news lately because the new official name of, of that condition is prolonged grief disorder. Mm -hmm. So what complicated grief is, what prolonged grief disorder is, is it is grief that it lasts too long for what is normal in your society and what mm -hmm. most people suffer. Mm -hmm. and, and it's debilitating. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so difficult to live with. It prevents you from moving on, you get stuck. Um, Dr. Kathy Shear, who is one of the foremost researchers in complicated grief and prolonged grief disorder. I love her phrase, it's such a simple thing, but it's so true. It's grief gone awry. It's, grief gone awry. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, you get stuck, you can't move on. And yet we talk about grief as a journey I was, my grief had gone so far awry that I couldn't think of it that way. I just knew I was stuck in a prison. Mm -hmm. and, and you were saying it was, you felt it was somewhat habitual for you that you had started, it yes. was a habit of being in that, in that place all the time. So you decided you got tired of being tired. And now I know you, you've gone on to do some yoga. With the help of a little persuasion from my family, um, I, I finally moved into a condominium. Lo and behold, the condom in the building in which I lived, there was a gym. They began offering yoga classes and a couple people had encouraged me to try yoga because they felt it was a healing thing to do. And as you were saying, Gloria, a, a gentle approach, which would, would have been all I could take. And so I started doing yoga. The light started to come on in wow. my mind. 
Well, you're making a good point, Andrea, because a lot of people say to me, I don't feel well enough to work out. Oh, and I think that you've got to, they have it backwards. You know, if you don't feel well enough, that's when you need to do these things emotionally, if you don't feel well, because yes, then like you're right. saying for you, it lifted that feeling of feeling so badly emotionally. Yes. You have hit the nail on the head. That is exactly what happened to me. How hard was it for you to, get, to do your yoga? And, and now you've written a book about it. I just can't tell you the healing power it had for me. Wow. You know, what a metaphor, though. I'm thinking nine years after your husband passed away, you didn't know you, have, you were flexible. And suddenly you went into an environment where you realized that you were flexible again. I mean, it is such a wonderful metaphor. Um, that's why I called my yoga book Restoring Flexibility. A gentle yoga-based practice to increase mobility at any age. I mean, that is the last part of that book is such an important part. Yeah. And mom, I guess I'm wondering, Andrea, it, it makes me want to do yoga right now hearing y'all talk <laughs> because I, I love yoga too. And my mom found it very healing after my brother died. And I, I, you know, have been doing yoga for many, many years as well. Are there, is there anything that we could do right now, just sitting here, just, you know, doing some kind of stretching or something that could help be helpful for people? We could put our arms out to the side with our palms facing down and see if we can get our arms even with our shoulders. If we can, you know, that's okay too, but just about even. And then we can turn our palms toward the sky and bring our arms over it and gently bring them back out and face our palms toward the ground. Now face our palms toward the sky and bring our arms over it. But let's see if we can put our palms together with our arms over our head. And now what, with our palms touching, let's bring our arms down and bring our palms to our breast. Ah. And those are, you That's know- That's lovely. Even when you I sit up in bed in the morning, just getting your arms moving mm -hmm. is an energizer, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah, especially because usually our arms are below our hearts. Yes. Yes, you're right, Heidi. I love right. that we put, you put, you had us put them above our hearts. Yes. If people are listening to this, they're resonating with it, they're tired of being tired, what's a good first step for them? And what, what would you recommend? Um, I've thought about this a lot because I wanted to talk about it in, in my book. Um, I would try to do something that has you looking out instead of in. So one of the things that helped me um, was I had been a knitter since childhood. My mother had taught me how to knit when I was a girl. And um, I decided to pick up a knitting project. I knit a vest actually is what it was. And just the joy of sitting and knitting, which is such a peaceful rhythmic activity. The other thing is- um, And knitting is also med meditation. Yes, you're right, Heidi. That's it and so it quiets our mind. It reminds me of Anne Hood's book, The Mid Knitting Circle. And yes. when her daughter Grace died, she knitted her way back to hope again. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Knitting is powerful. I like that that was one of the things that you did. Yes, it, it was about the only thing I could get interested in. So that idea of trying to uh, do something that has you looking outward, whether it's going back into the garden, maybe. Um, uh, whether um, uh, maybe it's some kind of involvement with your kids or grandkids, but something that changes your outlook um, that idea of uh, losing yourself to find yourself. So I like that. that outward looking activity can bring you to a more peaceful place within. At least that was my experience. I like the losing yourself to find yourself. And I know my mother golfs and golfing has been an important part of her healing journey since my dad died. 
I would suggest to people, if you're feeling that loneliness, and, and I think it's important, Andrea, to people don't know how lonely some people are feeling too, because it's compartmentalized. And you yourself might even know, okay, I'm functioning at work. I can just keep doing this up. I can keep it up. But I would suggest that you get Andrea's book, After Effects Memoir of Complicated Grief and Restoring, and also her second book, Restoring Flexibility, a Gentle Yoga-Based Practice to Increase Mobility at Any Age. I, I think both of those books are going to be remarkable for you to find that spot. So where can people get your books and give us your website and all that? Um, I have a website, um, andreagillitz.com. You can link Amazon or your favorite independent bookseller um, to buy both books. Both books are out there. Have you got one last word you want to give to somebody who's feeling they have complicated grief right now? I would say the advice I would give is for people um, to use, to try open themselves to sites, websites like Open to Hope, because you can stay anonymous, you can experience other people's stories, you can let yourself feel whatever pain you are feeling, and yet open yourselves to others. The other thing I would really recommend is um, the Center for Prolonged Grief at Columbia University um, is a wonderful site. There's a section of that site called For the Public, and it's an introduction. It tells you what complicated grief is and prolonged grief disorder. Um, and just knowing makes you feel better. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today and for all the good you're doing in the world. And uh, congratulations on your journey and uh, finding hope again. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Heidi. I'm, and it's just an honor to be part of what the two of you are doing and Heather also. Thank you, Andrea. And you are definitely example, an example of the fact that it is never too late for hope. And thanks everybody for joining us on this show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.